Welcome to Bar Chart's series of webinars designed to educate you about a variety of market concepts, inform you of the features and tools Bar Chart provides related to these concepts, and finally to give you some traders' insight to help make a more informed investment decision. Today's subject light up your portfolio with cannabis stocks. Now, today's session is going to be a little bit different from our regular webinars. I'm going to concentrate on this flowering multi-billion dollar cannabis industry, which has germinated out of the medical marijuana use space and has grown exponentially with the acceptance and public support for legalization. Now, the cannabis industry has budded into a sordid variety of public companies, from cultivation to consumer goods, from pharmaceuticals to technologies, and even the most seasoned investor could be dazed and confused with all of these companies. So let me be blunt. Before we dab into the cannabis sector, it's essential for you guys to understand to consider the risk and headwinds facing today's market leaders. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is John Rowland, uh, Bar Charts Head of Trading Education, and with me today is my partner and our moderator, Bar Charts Project Director, Gene Baker. Hello, Gene. Good afternoon, John. How are you? I am doing just fine. How many times did you cringe with every one of those puns in that introduction? Uh. I cringed every time, every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to make it fun sometimes, right, Gene? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know, I know. I like to be a little punny every once in a while, but maybe we get some folks' attentions. Um, so we're ready to get started then. We got a lot to get to today. Yes, I know you've got a full agenda, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Thanks, Gene. All right, here we go. All right, so again, remember today's session is for educational purposes and decisions to buy, hold, sell, or trade in securities, commodities, or other investments. It vows risk and best made under the advice of a qualified financial um, professional. Now, I'm going to present a lot of facts and fundamental information, and then to my best knowledge and my research, that I believe that these are, are true. Uh, facts, but they not, have not been verified or confirmed by an independent party. And so under no circumstances shall we be liable for any loss or damages you or anyone else incurs as a result of any trading or investment activity that you or anyone engages in based on this information or material you receive through barchart.com and our services. Okay. So some FYIs for the cannabis sector. Um, you know, the cannabis plant is known by many slangs. Um, it comes from three different strains. Uh, each plant has over 400 different types of compounds and 100 cannabinoids. Now, the two most notable that most po folks are familiar with is THC, the psychoactive uh, cannabinoid. That would be the one that makes you high. And the CBD, that would be more the medical application. Now, medical applications for cannabis now include three FDA-approved drugs. And right now, there are several uh, clinical trials ranging from everything from PTSD, uh, autism, um, chronic pain, and even COVID-19. Now, there's been this major change in public sentiment. And over 90% of Americans now believe that there should be some form of cannabis reform or legalization. If we look at the demographics in terms of just legalization, it's around 65%. The industry itself has grown globally, $21 billion in legal sales across 21 countries. In the U.S., it's basically legal in some form, mostly medical, in almost every state in the union. Now, 16 states allow recreational use, and what is really also known as adult use. 
And cannabis is now the fifth largest cash crop in the United States. And as we, if we look at it in terms of a percentage, it is the fastest growing sector. Now, it's not all cherry pie and gelatos. The cannabis industry faces several hurdles. And the most vulnerable one is that cannabis is still a Schedule I controlled substance. But help is on the way. First, we have the Moores Act. Now, this is the first step to decriminalizing cannabis. It was recently, it has been passed through the House, but it is facing op opposition in the Senate. Now, the bill has three prong objectives. The first is to end criminalization. The second is to eliminate criminal penalties. And the third uh, takes major steps towards criminal reform, social justice, and most importantly, for us investors, economic development. So that will include also creating a tax on retail sales, open the door to research, better banking and tax laws. And so that's the next hurdle that cannabis uh, faces, the banking laws that are around cannabis right now because it's still a uh, Schedule I uh, controlled substance. So the next law that is up for con before Congress is the Safe Banking law, uh, Bill. Now this bill will prohibit federal regulators from penalizing a depository institution, a bank for instance, from providing banking services to legitimate cannabis related businesses. And so those proceeds from those legitimate businesses or transactions will not be considered proceeds from an unlawful activity and also potentially mon money laundering. So the essence of this bill allows commercial banking and payments to begin in this process of capital flow in and out of the industry and also the legalization or legitimizing profits in the eyes of the IRS. So if we look at the cannabis industry, if you walk into, for instance, a dispensary and you buy something, you have to pay in cash. And so a lot of the business that is done in cannabis right now is in cash. A Safe Banking Act will allow credit card companies to now legitimize this business, will allow then credit cards to be used. And this will increase the potential growth for the cannabis industry. Now, as important as legalization is, I really believe that this is the linchpin for the cannabis sector. Without you know, the ability of capital flow in and out of the uh, sector, it's just going to remain or fragmented by a set of rules set by state and state on an individual basis. And this is going to restrict interstate commerce and also growth. Now, once these two hurdles fall, the final one is less restrictive and maybe a little bit more about conforming and standardization, and that is the FDA. So we're really talking about the F in FDA, food. So what happens is the FDA can now test and do research on consumer goods. And that testing will also create regulations and guidelines and for instance, dosing standards in terms of how um, least consumer goods are being produced. Now, this will create a headwind because it will bring greater scrutiny on a lot of these consumable goods and could actually eventually um, eliminate some products whose claims of effectiveness might be proven wrong. And that would come from out of our research and our development based on the FDA. So it can be both positive and negative, but I, this, this is more down the, the road, a, a headwind that's, that we need to be aware of. You know, think about like diet pills. Have you ever seen those commercials for diet pills where, you know, it says, you know, our claims haven't been tested by the FDA. And this is definitely something that is gonna be part of uh, the growth of the cannabis sector. 
So what are some of the tailwinds or some of the positive reasons why we want to invest in the cannabis sector? So with every new state's legalization, uh, especially those states that are going to allow adult use, we get this greater industrial growth and industry growth. And it's gonna come in a variety of arenas uh, from cultivation, uh, medical and consumer products, uh, retail dispensaries, um, and each one of these areas needs uh, support or companies that are going to uh, support that economic activity. For instance, like a grower needs hydroponic equipment and fertilizer. So those secondary segment opportunities might be the better investment opportunities for us as we look at the um, cannabis uh, industry. But growth will definitely come through adult use, and it seems that many of the large players in this sector are focusing on adult use. Now, for instance, New Jersey starts adult use sales tomorrow, and many analysts, <coughs> excuse me, believe that New Jersey alone will become a $2 billion market by 2025. But growth in other high density uh, states, uh, New York, Maryland, but we also have other states, for instance, like New Mexico are now have adult use. And then again, we talked about the part of the FDA and research, but also medical applications will be a lot more streamlined and clinical trials are increasing dramatically as we're finding more and more uses, medical uses for cannabis. Now, one of the ones that is quite interesting is that there's a, predic a particular cannabinoid, <laughs> say that three times, uh, that attaches itself to the spike protein in COVID. And this inhibits it from attaching to human cells. So this is a kind of interesting uh, clinical study that is, is, is ongoing. So we think we'll talk about these, these tailwinds. As a greater picture, I want us to think about the next wave or next big tailwind as these hurdles come down. And I really believe the next market growth or this greatest tailwind to come is gonna come from brand emergence, right? What products are gonna be accepted by the general product company? What companies, brands are going to be recognized by the general public? In other words, who's gonna become the McDonald's of weed? And I think this is where the real growth is gonna come and there's mergings of particular brands. So who are some of the market leaders and group segments inside the cannabis industry? So the first group that we're gonna concentrate on is called the multiple state operators, the MSOs. Now, they can be a variety of them. Most of them are what we call vertically integrated operators and these are ones that go from seed to sales they grow they produce they make a product and then they sell it or it could be a management group of retail outlets in other words dispensaries so eventually i believe that we're, we're going to be left with a handful of players in this space and they're going to control all of the licensed dispensaries. Now, those that will rise to the top, either through mergers and acquisitions, or those are gonna have a greater variety of brands and brand recognitions. So let's look at a few of the majors in this particular group. Now, in no particular order here, uh, from the top to the bottom here, the first one is Cure Leaf. Now this company is based in Massachusetts. It is a seeds to sale vertically integrated operator. It has presence in 23 states. It owns 128 dispensaries, has 26 different cultivation sites, 
uh, in states like Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Now, last year, there was a record fiscal year for them. Uh, the revenue was $1.2 billion, that's with a B, and that was up 93% from the previous year. Their EBITDA was $298 million, and that was up over 100% from the previous year. Now, this company is also expanding into Europe, but here's the catch. It is yet not to be profitable. In the fourth quarter of last year, it lost $0.04 cents per share. Now, that compares to a loss of $0.06 cents, um, from 2020. And overall, in 2021, it lost $0.15 cents per share. But it is moving closer to profitability, and it is one of the top uh, MSOs in market value. The next one is Cresco Labs. Uh, this, again, this is a vertic vertically integrated operator, seed to sales. It has one of the largest category of branded goods. Now, recently, it entered into a $2 billion deal to acquire Columbia Care. Now, Columbia Care was more of what we would call a strong retail footprint, in other words, um, uh, dispensaries. And Columbia Care had a footprint in New Jersey. So Cresco Labs uh, now has a footprint in uh, New Jersey. Now, the deal expands Crestcore's operations from 10 states to 17 states. Most of their operations prior to the acquisition were in western states. Now, the combined companies will now create a corporation that will have the largest annual revenue, $1.4 billion. Okay, so let me just do this before we move on. Under In bar chart, under uh, stocks, if you go into the stock section, we have what's called market ideas, and we have the cannabis market ideas, and that takes you to this page. Now, what I've done is I've condensed this page down into a watch list, and the watch list is going to have the stocks that we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about uh, throughout our webinar today. So let me show you that. And here is that watch list. So what we're going to see in all of the cannabis stocks, especially those that are pure cannabis plays, when we start looking at the charts of these companies, you're going to see that they're pretty much exactly the same chart. The prices might be different, but the chart price action is relatively the same. So here's Cure Leaf, and here is Cress. Collabs. Now, Tilray is a very interesting player in the cannabis space. This once $300 stock, Tilray, excuse me, this once $300 stock is now only trading just below six dollars but this is by far the largest reaching company in the cannabis sector this multinational company has presence in us canada europe australia and latin america at last count they're in 20 different countries now it is a vertically integrated company uh, cultivation research di distribution it has 20 brands uh, most of them are in the hemp-based food sector, but they are in the craft business and they are getting into the spirits business. Now, 36% of their sales come from cannabis, 41% uh, from distribution of medical uh, pharma, in particularly in Europe. And one of the interesting facts about this company is that their international revenue was up a staggering 4,000% quarter prior to last quarter over last year. Now, most of those gains came because they have entered into the Latin American market. Another interesting feature about Tilray 
is its short interest. In other words, how many p traders have shorted this stock? The short interest in Tilray is around 39%. Now, what does that mean? Well, maybe you've heard of something called a meme stock. Remember the likes of GameStock and AMC? And there's been a lot of talk about this particular stock because of this large short interest. And so what has happened is a lot of these memes kind of gang up and they try to squeeze, short squeeze the shorts. And if we look at this little blip in price a few months ago in Tilray, that increase in price happened right after the House passed the Moores Act. So this stock could be susceptible to larger price gains when we start seeing some of these hurdles fall because of this large short interest. But again, you can see price has fallen right back down to the lows that we've seen over the last year or so. TrueLeave started as a medical marijuana company in Florida. Now, they have 161 dispensaries. 112 of them are in Florida. But they recently acquired Harvest Health for $1.7 billion, which was the largest uh, merger in the cannabis sector up until recently with the Cresco, Cresco Labs in Columbia Care. Now, that allowed Trulieve to get into states like Arizona, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Now, one of the metrics that makes Trulieve an interesting for an investor is this company has been profitable for 15 consecutive quarters. And when we look at the margins that this company has, it has the best margin profile of all the multiple state operators. Now, their net income last year was up about 7%, and their revenue was up about 64%. Then we have Greenleaf Industries. This is a multiple state operator based out of Illinois. They have 73 stores. Uh, they're going to open 10 new ones this year, and they're going to acquire 12 new stores. Now, most of those acquires are going to come in the state of New Jersey. And again, another positive metrics for this one is that they have had eight quarters of positive cash flow. So these are really the main five. Uh, there are other players you can see on the list. Um, when you go to our cannabis um, page, you'll see multiple state operators. But these are really kind of the main five that you want to focus on. So the next group is our pharmaceutical and our medical sector. Now there's two routes we can take here. First, we can look at more established pharmaceutical companies that have a, a medical marijuana division. And those would be the likes of AbbVie and Jazz Pharmaceutical. So let's look at those. So again, MV is a stock that has been doing really well, but I think it's more about the pharmaceutical industry and not necessarily on that division that has cannabis. Now, Jazz, again, this is a well-designed uh, um, pharmaceutical company. It's been around for a while. But they have a cannabis product that is in phase three. It's an epilepsy uh, drug. And there are some talk that there could be some applications once it passes, this drug passes the FDA, that there could be other applications for other brain uh, disorders. Again, investing in these is you're just you're just getting a piece of the cannabis market. So what from a trader's perspective these might be better trading opportunities right better liquidity trending positive price movement but they might be maybe just a little bit removed from the cannabis sector now if you're looking for companies that are pure cannabis medical companies then the ones that we can start looking at is aurora cannabis uh, canopy growth and chronos now these companies started out as medical 
marijuana companies, but they have expanded and brought many products to the market, and they also have a lot of branding. Now, for instance, uh, Canopy Growth is the largest Canadian cannabis company, and it has the, one of the largest array of branded products. Most of them are CBD products, right? not in the THC sector. Again, if we look at their charts, and I'll look at one in a second, we're going to see a very similar story as we saw in our multiple state operators. Now, if you want a pure cannabis pharmaceutical play, then uh, Zenirba, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, would be that company. So here is Aurora. Again, you kind of see that long drawn out downtrend maybe for an investor you know these are bottoming here's our canopy again long drawn out downtrends kind of going going sideways you know again maybe the valuations on these ones as an investor uh, you know maybe are cheap but it might be a long time before these ones start paying off here's that Zenirba, again, very similar chart. But like I said to you before, uh, this is a pure pharmaceutical play in the cannabis sector, right? No products, no branding. Um, but this company has a large global presence in terms of their clinical testing. What they're doing is they have a lot of products in the pipeline, but they're testing them or they're doing their clinical trials outside of the U.S. where they might find favorable regulations. And it kind of makes sense if they uh, they could get approval of some of these products, for instance, like in the U.K. or Germany, it might be a lot easier for them when that headwind from the FDA falls here in the U.S. for them to bring more products uh, to market more uh, very specific medical pro products to the U.S. market, okay? So growers. Now, from a trader standpoint, not really interested in growers at this point. For the same reason we just saw with the other charts with our MSOs and some of those pharmaceuticals. We're really not showing any kind of a trend. They're just kind of trading sideways. So we're not really there yet. Now, from an investor standpoint, again, their valuations are very low, but growers also face other headwinds, and they are very similar to headwinds that you would see, let's say, any farmer or any any agricultural uh, markets, the cost of capital, um, the input costs, uh, for instance, um, you know, many uh, growers, these growers are in states that have high uh, energy prices, electricity costs. Uh, growers is a, a high energy consuming, dense consuming uh, industry, right? The, the lamps and, and uh, the meters and, and the filtration systems um, inside of these um, facilities. Leasing, you know, leasing these cultivating facilities, right? Uh, uh, the ability to grow all these plants in these big giant greenhouses. But they're also thinking about like fertilizers, right? Fertilizer prices have gone crazy in the last few months. And so those are more headwinds that growers are going to face. And also a final headwind is a lot of growers are facing shrinking margins from the black market, from illegal growers, but also from home uh, growers, folks who are growing their own plants. So that is another headwind that they have to be, are facing. But on the positive side, this sector is definitely one of the sectors that will truly benefit from the Safe Banking Act, because then these companies will be able to tap into credit markets, and that will help uh, lower a lot of their um, input costs. 
Now, if you don't want to go into growers, we talked about this segmentation of secondary industries that are going to support um, these individual groups. So let's talk about that in the growers sector. So the first one here, grow generation. It is GRWG. Again, if we look at their chart, very similar story. But if we look at the market profile of this company, what this company does is it owns and operates specialty retail hydroponic stores. It also sells state-of-the-art equipment um, for indoor use in commercial growers as well as home growers. And you can see the different states that it's located on. So this is a secondary industry that is supporting the cannabis uh, sector. And so this, as the cannabis sector grows, certainly then this company uh, will grow with it. Now, if this one is one that is maybe uh, too risky for you or that you don't like it because it's not really moving yet, we could go for a little bit more generic or maybe widely accepted company, the more established company. And that one would be Scott's Miracle Grow. And yes, that is the same company that makes the lawn and garden and leaf and weed and Roundup and all those other, well, I think they sold Roundup, but all those other things that you see at Home Depot. But not too many people know this, that there is a division in Scott's miracle Grow that caters to the cannabis sector. So you can look at the profile here again that, uh, you know, Scott and Miracle Grow, Ortho, all these other ones. But just down here it says its customers include commercial nurseries, greenhouses, and specialty crop growers, the cannabis sector. So again, you know, you could if you wanted to be in the cannabis sector, but you wanted a little bit of a buffer or a little bit of a diversification in one particular stock, this might be one of those stocks that you could look at. All right, so let's say uh, you're looking for opportunities that are away from touching the plant, like for instance, growers. Now here might be your answer. So the first two, Leafy, Leafly and Maps, are uh, two online companies that started out as more of an informational websites. Now Leafly offered information on different types of strains, and it was a database for uh, education for a user collective, you know, like a library. Maps was really more of an app uh, application, an uh, app for locating dispensaries. But both have now moved towards looking at the retail side. And also they offer a kind of an alternative to advertisement opportunities in the cannabis sector. In other words, for retail operators to advertise or brands to advertise. Now, Leafly is very interesting to me. Uh, and this is because of its traffic and its, diverse, its diversification of brands that it represents. But also, it's one of the few SPAC, uh, SPAC excuse me, uh, success stories. You may have heard of SPACs, right? A lot of the SPAC uh, stocks that haven't done very well. But this company was originally a SPAC, and then it went to an IPO just recently. Now, the company was actually founded in 2010, but it didn't come to market until just uh, a, a few months ago. Again, in the cannabis sector, these cannabis companies are forced to find alternative ways to raise capital. If we had the Safe Banking Act passed, then they could just go to the regular markets. But here's the facts behind Leafly that makes this company very interesting to me. First of all, it has 125 million visitors last year. Now, that's three times as much as MAPS. It represents 4,600 licensed retailers and 7,800 different brands of those 4,600 
licensed retailers. Now, its revenue last year was around $36 million, and that was up 19% from the year before. Uh, but analysts are expecting that this company's um, revenue will reach $150 million by 2024. Now, its revenue is subscription-based. Uh, retailers pay them uh, a fee to put, you know, put their products on their on their website. But if we get that Safe Banking Act, you know, this could allow for um, interstate commerce, and then this company could also generate income from sales. In other words, you get a commission from how many sales that are done over their website. So thinking about this one, I'm thinking like this one could become the Amazon of weed if we get the right legislative uh, environment. Now the other two on the bottom of the page here are what I would call speculative home runs or lottery tickets. A Kerna, Kern, tickle symbol, this is a uh, regulatory compliance technology company. Um, its central data management system is used in the cannabis industry from seed to sale. Um, in other words, tracking as the product moves down, let's say the product line. And this type of software is going to be crucial and it's going to be needed to satisfy those opponents of legalization. In other words, you know, we don't want products to get in the hands of children. That's always been one of the concerns. So now we know if we find one of those products, we know not only where did it came from or what was the progression of that, how it could have gotten there. So that would be an, an important aspect outside of the cannabis industry. And then the next one, the cannabis technology. Well, this company engages in tools for law enforcement and workplace to detect THC in the breath. In other words, a breathalyzer for cannabis. And again, you know, this is kind of that secondary or tertiary company that's going to benefit from the growth and consumption of cannabis products. So there's really no easy way to decide which one of these growth uh, sectors is going to be the one that's going to grow. The easier way to maybe invest in the cannabis sector, at least over the long term, especially if you're going to be a passive uh, investor, is why don't we pay somebody else to weed through this wild west world of the cannabis industry and we'll wait for a clearer horizon in terms of the legislative landscape before committing capital to for instance a very specific company in the cannabis sector so that would be etfs and etfs do two things first of all it helps us uh, concentrate our capital through diversification. In other words, you know, if I only have a certain amount of money, I want to uh, invest in the cannabis sector, you know, trying to pick five or six in different stocks, individual stocks that are going to perform, an ETF will allow me to get a little bit more bang for my buck because they are diversified. Now, what is very important in any kind of ETF selection, not just in the cannabis sector is it's important for you to understand what companies the ETFs are investing in. So uh, in our, um, on our webpage, when you look at these ETFs, again, these will be found in that cannabis list. Go down to where it says constituents, and this is going to show you the companies that they are investing in. For instance, this one, the uh, MSOS, the multiple state operator one, you can see that there is a lot of those multiple state operators we just talked about inside of this ETF. But we also do get a little bit of diversification outside of those multiple state operators. For instance, this one here is a REIT, 
this was a REIT that um, rents facilities out, leases facilities out to growers. Um, there's our gen, our grow gen, our supplier, um, and there's a couple other, a little bit more diversified. Not not as much, probably more and more just multiple state operators. This one, the MJ, the Mary Jane. This is one of the older ETFs. This one's been around for a while. And this one has definitely got a lot more diversification in inside of it. First of all, there's our Tilray brand right at the top and our Canopy, the two major players in the cannabis sector. But again, we got our growers, our suppliers, uh, our pharmaceuticals, our technology companies, right? And even down here where you got the old R.J. Reynolds and the Philip Morris and the British Tobacco, you get a little di dividend play. Not a lot, but a little bit of a dividend play. And then, again, down here, there's your Scott's miracle Grow. So you get a really nice diversification uh, in the, this one. Now, full disclosure here in terms of ETFs, um, the one that I've chosen is the Amplified. And what makes this one a little bit different than the other ones is there's a couple things I like about it. First of all, it's called an active ETF, which means that the – governing rules of this ETF, they can be a lot more dynamic or a lot more uh, quick to react to changes in the cannabis sector. They don't need to wait for a quarter or a year to rebalance their portfolio. They can do it instantaneously. And if you go on their website and you look at, because um, it's always changing, that's why I recommend that you go to the website. Uh, look at what companies are diversified in. And you get a good mix, not only multiple state operators and growers, but you get those technology um, aspect as well. So a lot of interesting companies in that uh, ETF. And again, for me as a trader, you know, I want to look at an opportunities in the cannabis market, but I really don't see any trading opportunities until I see these headwinds fall. But as a long-term investor, oh, this might be, you know, because I believe that the cannabis sector in terms of valuation might be uh, cheap, this is a way for me to invest in, in the greater uh, industry. And then I'll just wait for which one of the companies will start being the stars, the ones that start uh, rising in valuation. Okay. So what are some of the takeaways from today's session? So first, federal legislation is the key to the expanding the cannabis sector. We cannot do it without it. Will it grow? Yes. Will it grow uh, largely or have exponential growth? Maybe. But until we get federal legislation, this is really the largest um, hurdle that we need to get over. This wide fragmentation of the cannabis industry, all these different little groups inside of the cannabis uh, sector will offer us opportunities. Now, what will those opportunities come or where will they come from, right? Will it be from our seed to sales? sector? Will it be in our, from our dispensaries? Will it be from those secondary industries that support the cannabis uh, sector? Or will it be the technology companies that the new technologies that are going to come out of the cannabis sector? These technology companies that are going to feed off the growth of the cannabis sector. Now, as I said to you before, let's think about the next tailwind. What is really going to, once we get to those those hurdles to drop, and I want you to focus on companies that have strong branding or commercial recognition. I remember our McDonald's of weed or our Amazon of weed in the case of like the Philip Morris's and the um, R.J. Reynolds, right? The Marlboro of weed, right? 
those brands that are going to start becoming recognizable to you um, are going to be the companies I believe in the long run are going to do the best. The other aspect of this fragmentation is M&A or mergers and acquisitions, this consolidation of this industry. And we're seeing this going on now, right? A lot of the companies are creating growth by buying other companies. So you can play this two ways, right? You can look at those large companies that are gobbling up companies, those that are going to be around, or you could speculate on those companies that you believe that are going to be gobbled up. You could play it that way. And then finally, I think for a passive investor, if somebody is interested in the cannabis sector, but you don't want to take the time or have to spend a lot of time watching a particular stock or you know, doing the homework, let somebody else do the homework for you, right? Let them, you're paying them for that. Let them do that. And that an ETF might be the ultimate investment vehicle for now until we get again, that greater view on the legislative horizon. Okay, I see a couple questions. I want to answer a couple questions, but I do want to leave you guys with one final thought. Any other questions, Gene, that are coming up that are kind of generic? Uh, no, not really. I've passed a few questions on to you, John. Uh, the one thing I do want to maybe point out to everybody is that, you know, John's given you a lot of examples of the different segments in this industry. And Bar Chart is a perfect place for you to use as your uh, vehicle to start looking at some of these different stocks and, and looking at um, their background, their profiles, uh, how they're doing. Take a look at the flip charts on that cannabis, cannabis stocks idea page. Uh, you do not have to be a premier member in order to look at the information, um, but we are going to always recommend that you take a 30-day trial for Bar Chart Premier, because if you do find interesting ideas, you can save them in your account, you can run screeners on them, you can send yourself uh, alerts even, price and news alerts on these on these uh, stocks and symbols that you find interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I do the kind of the same thing, Gene. I mean, like, for instance, the cannabis watch list that I created, I do have that sent to me um, at the end of the day. Just I just want to see if any of them are doing something silly or something like recently when we saw that big price spike. And a lot of these companies, when we got that Moore's Act, um, Pass and it was something that I wasn't aware of until you know I saw that on my watch list. So there's a couple of questions here. One of them is, can one of the bills be passed or acts be passed without the other, or does it have to? Do they have to fall in line? Again, I'm not a, a legal legislator. I do think that uh, you know there's a lot of. I think the the pathway for the safe banking is definitely one that has less um, uh, hurdles or headwinds in front of it. In other words, opposition in the two uh, houses of the Senate, where the legalization part, I think, is there's a lot of more nuances that need to be hashed out between uh, the two different House and the Senate. So could one be passed before the other? I, I mean, I guess so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But I don't think that we can get to where we want to be as an investor until we get legalization. And then I think if legalization falls, then so then will the safe banking. Because they're going to have to deal with, um, you know, how companies are dealing with, you know, monies flowing in and out of, for instance, the dispensaries. Um, so there's a question here about, you know, headwinds and being eliminated. Will a lot of these OTC companies start being listed on major ex exchanges? Yeah, I, mean, I, guess, I guess that would be the next path for them, you know, as they as they, as they grow in companies. You know, um, you know, how does 
over the counter or pink sheets and then how do you get onto let's say the the larger exchanges well your stock price has to have a certain value for a certain period of time you have to have enough uh you know revenue and there's other, other categories that they look at uh so ivan asks i've noticed that volumes value uh very greatly from stock to stocks etf and etf so he asked is there a minimum volume that you recommend for trading now this is not necessarily for the cannabis sector but my personal feeling is you know in terms of any stock that i want to trade you know i kind of use that 500,000 shares is a threshold right now you could lower that a hundred thousand but again yeah if you're looking at some of these stocks that only traded a few thousand shares a day again maybe we wait until they become a little bit more active before we actually start uh, trading them because normally you if you have a very low low volume uh company uh, or stock you know you, you could get a very large bid ass which also could mean that you know you get a lot of slippage or that when you try to get in or get out, you know, you're giving away a little bit of a profit or um, uh, losses. So Linda asks, does the state, the Safe Banking Act cover the IRS problem of companies not being able to deduct this? Yeah, that's exactly what the Safe Act, Banking Act is. What it's going to do, it's going to legitimize profits in these companies and that legitimization will come at the benefit from how they handle profits and how they record profits and how they deal with the irs so yes that is all part of it. it's all wrapped upside in inside of it um so brian asks what accounts for the success of canadian companies or mj companies that early on versus say the u.s counterparts again it's very obvious is because in canada it's legal you know across all the provinces in the united states you know we have this fragmented market right we only had you know in the beginning we only had you know california colorado Washington, Oregon, right? So very slow for a lot of these companies. And also going back to that Safe Banking Act, you know, how were profits handled? Right? Remember, it was a cash business. I mean, a lot of these companies, you know, they were like, you know, they had a lot of costs because they had to hire, you know, security and armored trucks to move their cash around, right? So, you know, a lot of costs, at extraneous costs that not having total legalization and also not having, you know, really defined safe banking rules, Brian. Okay. All right. So let's do this before we finish up. I want to get, leave you guys with one final thought. Well, actually, what I want to do is I want to ask you guys a question. So think about it, and I want you to type in your answer uh, into the comments. Now, even if you guys are watching this uh, on a recording on our YouTube channel, please, for me, type in the comments the answer that's going to pop into your head. All right, here's the question. Name a current most popular celebrity who you would associate with cannabis. In other words, name me a celebrity that you associate with weed? Oh, we have quite a few of them, John. Oh, cool. <laughs> Is, I see one that says uh, Cheech and Chong. Yeah, that might be right if it were 1979, right, Gene? Um, no, think about a pop star, right, who's gone mainstream. Oop. Yeah. Snoop Dogg, right? That would be my choice. Was that some of the choices that were popping up there, Gene? Oh, yeah. Snoop Dogg, <laughs> Elon Musk, Woody Harrelson, <laughs> Willie Nelson. Yeah. Willie Nelson, that would be a good one. Yeah, for sure. For so sure. why why did you pick Snoop? Well, let's think about this. Do you think it's a coincidence that Snoop Dogg is a spokesman for Corona? 
Did you know that Constellations Brands has developed a THC uh, infused beer? So think about this. Once we get that Moore's Act, once we get safe banking, once the laws allow for interstate commerce of cannabis, do you think Constellation Brands is going to drop it like it's hot? And Snoop will be switching his gin and juice for Corona High and be telling us everything is beautiful, baby? I think so. Now, listen, I don't know which one of these companies is going to emerge or which ones are going to survive this M&A process. Um, you know, I wish I had that crystal ball to predict that. But I believe that it will be very obvious to us, right? It's just timing. You just got to wait. And it's going to be those brands that are recognizable. It's going to be those consumable goods that are going to be endorsed by popular personalities. And those are the companies that are going to take our portfolio higher. So I know it was a little tongue in cheek today. I hope you guys enjoyed this one on 420. Uh, you know, but I did take this really seriously. I really kind of want to hope that I gave you guys enough information. You know, again, no pun intended to kind of weed through the process. And again, I think, you know, it really comes down to about, you know, is there a rush to get into a lot of these stocks? Probably not. Um, uh, and, and as a long-term investor, is there opportunities for sure? There's going to be some huge opportunities in this uh, in uh, this sector. For a trader, uh, maybe not, not yet. Let's wait. Let's see what happens. Um, certainly, you know, in the short term. Okay. So, John, let's talk about next week. If you're wrapped up here. Sure. Let's do that. Yeah, we're getting to the top of the hour. Okay, so next week, so as a trader, um, one of the things that, you know, I hear a lot of um, other traders talk about is like they're always looking for the, the next new thing or, you know, the next indicator or, or you know, uh, you know, chart analysis or whatever. And a lot of them miss one of the easiest and simple and most reliable uh, indicators, and that is volume. And I really believe volume tells us a powerful story. It tells us, you know, it's, it's this, this transaction between uh, buyers and sellers. And so that price is really basically the result a volume, if you think about it. And so that is one of the technical analysis that I use in my trading. So what we're going to do is we're going to go inside of volume. We're going to look at the different stages of volume as it relates to price. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples and sort of charts kind of looking at how we can identify the strength of our trend and maybe also using volume to help us uh, find potential changes in our trend or tops and bottoms. And then we'll, at the end, depending on how much time we have, we'll look at a few technical indicators that are volume-based. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, I think you're going to enjoy that one. It's going to be more like the typical uh, webinar sessions that we're at. So, again, I will remind you all, folks, is um, I think Gene will want me to do is that, you know, up here you can uh, get notifications when we have new sessions that come up. Again, we're not going to bombard you with spam. We're just going to let you know when the new session is going to come so you can sign up. And the other thing is that all the sessions that we do uh, are ending up on our YouTube channel. We're kind of in, I'm in a little phase here. I'm moving between homes, so my studio's back and forth. So, but eventually, sometime in about May or June, we'll start me a little, start putting more content in there in terms of shorter term content. But give me a couple of weeks, a month or so to get uh, squared up. But inside of the YouTube, 
And you can watch all the past webinar sessions. Did I miss anything else, Gene? I think I got everything. Nope, you, you got everything, something? Jen. That's good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, thanks, Gene, for making us uh, another great session. And uh, folks, I want to wish everybody, you know, stay safe out there, especially on 420 today. Uh, be healthy and the good of all trading.